Welcome to this presentation by Dr. Lydia Via Komarov, part of the Science, Technology, and Society Lecture Series at Elmhurst College. This presentation has been selected to be recorded for Chicago Amplified, a web-based audio program produced by WBEZ Chicago that captures some of the most exciting and informative cultural programming in the Chicago area. On your printed program, you'll find out how you can hear this lecture again or share it with others through Chicago Amplified. A video of today's lecture also will be available, so please refer to your program through the website. At this time, I'd like to ask that you please make sure your cell phones are turned off. And now I'd like to introduce the president of Elmhurst College, Dr. S. Allen Ray. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this year's Cesar Chavez Intercultural Lecture. The Chavez Lecture, which we offer each year in conjunction with Hispanic Heritage Month, celebrates the late Cesar Chavez, a Mexican-American who started life as a farm worker and became one of the nation's foremost labor leaders and civil rights activists. I'd like briefly to tell you about Elmer's College and our commitment to multiculturalism. One of the five core values of Elmer's College is community. We're committed to creating a place of cultural diversity. Our strategic plan calls for students from underrepresented groups to make up 25% of our entering undergraduate class by fall of 2014. Last year, through intentional admission recruitment practices, members of these groups made up 33% of our entering class, and this fall, the number is 34%. To give you a sense of historical perspective, at the time our strategic plan was adopted, in 2008-09, the total percentage of all students from underrepresented groups was slightly more than 17%. So through intentional planning, we've doubled our minority percentage in only five years. Last year, the number of applications from Hispanic young people tripled. This year, when we opened our doors, there were 320 Hispanic students in our traditional undergraduate class. That's an all-time high for us, representing slightly more now than 11% of our undergraduate student body and 99 of the 560 members of the just entering class are Hispanic, which represents a rounded 18% of that group, the same percentage as last year. Indeed, Hispanic students are choosing Elmhurst College in record numbers, and I think that is thanks to the quality of education we offer and to our consistent message of welcome to Hispanic students, their parents, and young Latinos and Latinas in the Chicago area and beyond. In response to this growing reputation, we've been selected each of the past two summers to host a large nationwide gathering of college-bound Hispanic youth. And cognizant of the strong emerging presence of Hispanic students in our school, two years ago we became a member of Hispanic Universities and Colleges of America. I hope my comments have indicated to you that Elmhurst College uh, does more than pay lip service to the ideal of forming a diverse learning community. In the spirit of Cesar Chavez, we are truly endeavoring to make the American dream a reality for all who aspire to it, to perform our duties of social responsibility, and to call on others to do the same. At this time, I'd like to invite Nina Delgado, treasurer of Hablamos, uh, to offer a few words to you uh, before we proceed. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marilena Delgado y yo soy la tesorera de Hablamos. Hablamos significa hispanoamericanos construyendo liderazgo, motivación, aceptación, oportunidad y fuerza. Es para mí un placer dar la bienvenida a todos ustedes aquí hoy para el anual Gas Ship de César Chávez. Hablamos es una organización estudiantil cuya misión es celebrar y compartir las ricas tradiciones y la profundidad de todas las culturas latinas, y también ser una presencia vibrante y visible en Elmhurst College. A través de nuestros esfuerzos, esperamos educar a la comunidad Elmhurst, romper con los estereotipos y ofrecer un sistema de apoyo positivo para todos los latinos y todos los miembros de la comunidad de Elmhurst. Gracias a todos por reunirnos hoy aquí para honrar el espíritu de César Chávez y dar bienvenida a la luz brillante del conocimiento que da la modelo ejemplar la doctora Villa Komarov compartirá con nosotros hoy. Y ahora me gustaría invitar a la profesora Melgren para presentar nuestra invitada. Gracias.
Good afternoon. My name is Marilena Delgado, and I am the treasurer for Hablamos. Hablamos stands for Hispanic Americans Building Leadership, Acceptance, Motivation, Opportunity, and Strength. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today for the annual Cesar Chavez Sketch Ship. Hablamos is a student organization whose mission is to celebrate and share the rich traditions and depth of all Latino cultures. Through our efforts, we hope to educate the Elmhurst community, break down stereotypes, and provide a positive system support for all Latinos and all members of the Elmhurst community. Thank you all for being here today as we gather to honor the spirit of Cesar Chavez, and as we welcome a visible Latina role model in society, Dr. Ria Conra, who will share the enlightening work that she has done with us here today. And now, I would like to invite Professor Milgram to come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Dr. Lydia Villa Komarov is an accomplished scientist and has held leadership positions in both academic institutions and in industry. She received her BA from Goucher College and her PhD in cell biology from MIT, where David Baltimore and Harvey Lodish were her graduate advisors. She did a postdoc in Walter Gilbert's laboratory, where she was a lead author of a landmark paper reporting the first synthesis of mammalian insulin in bacterial cells. Some of the biology majors in the audience will recognize some of those names and her work. She held research positions at Harvard University, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, and Children's Hospital in Boston, and has published over 70 research articles and reviews, many of them in the areas of insulin expression, processing, and secretion. She was Vice President for Research at Northwestern University and Vice President for Research and Chief Operating Officer of the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge. She is now a member of the Board of Directors and Chief Scientific Officer of the biotechnology company Cytonome ST. Dr. Via Kamaroff has been named a Fellow for the American Association for Advancement of Science and of the Association for Women in Science. She has been elected to the Hispanic Engineer National Achievement Hall of Fame and was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Hispanic Business Magazine. She is also a member of the National Academies of Science Standing Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Dr. Via Kamarov has made a special commitment to the recruitment and retention of minorities and women in science. She was a founding member of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science and has been both a board member and vice president of this organization. We are very excited to have her here and to hear her inspiring story. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lydia Via Kamara. Good afternoon. It's a very great pleasure to be here with you today. I'm very pleased with the, uh, that I was able to meet with students and to have lunch with some of the faculty and students and with your president today. And today what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about myself and a fair amount about the work that I'm doing now. Let's see, I have the clicker. Excellent. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background because I think it's important, particularly for the students in the audience, to recognize that whatever path you choose and whatever it is that you seek to learn as a student, it is applicable in almost any endeavor. And so although I began life as a biology student, uh, as an undergraduate, and went on to become a molecular biologist as a graduate student, during my career I have done a little bit of cell biology, endocrinology, neuroscience, uh, immunology, even some engineering, and I find myself involved in business and in politics uh, and policy matters as well. So it's not so much what it is that you do through your education, but rather the way that you learn to think about problems and how to solve them. So to begin, as an undergraduate, as I said, I was a biology major. As a graduate student, I went to MIT where I thought I was going to be a developmental biologist, but there wasn't anybody there that I wanted to, to work with who was in that field. And so I began by doing work with poliovirus. Um, and we worked with the vaccine, we didn't work with the vaccine strain, we worked with the wild type strain. 
And our interest was in how that virus made more of itself within human cells. I suspect that the most important lesson I learned in David Baltimore and Harvey Lodish's laboratories was that it is the experiment and the direct knowledge of something which is important. That has stood me in good stead throughout my career. And then I went on to develop a, uh, I went on to a postdoctoral work. If you're a biologist, the progression is you get your bachelor's degree, then you get a PhD, then you do an interim kind of thing, which is training, and you're sort of a quasi-independent scientist, but not quite. And then you get to go establish your own laboratory or do something else. And so for my postdoc, I set up a postdoc at Harvard University in the laboratory of Photoscopatos, where I thought I would be studying how silk moths develop their eggshell. Um, that turned out to be a very recalcitrant problem, and it didn't work very well. Um, but after I had been there for a while, uh, my colleague in that laboratory who was doing work in Walter Gilbert's laboratory, which was upstairs at Harvard, and he invited me to come join them because I had spent some time at Cold Spring Harbor because recombinant DNA, which was what we were doing at the time, was banned in Cambridge and Boston, and so I had to go to New York to do those experiments. But that gave me access to both knowledge and physical materials which made possible the work that we did in the insulin cloning. And what we did there was to take insulin from rats and mice and to connect it to DNA from bacteria and to put that DNA into the bacteria under conditions where the bacteria very happily made and secreted insulin. Uh, we thought we'd have to do that through many steps, uh, which has just taught me that luck does play a role. You do plan your experiments as carefully as you can, but if luck comes your way, by all means, take it. After that stint, uh, Wally Gilbert had uh, started a small company at the time. It was called Biogen. You may know it now as Biogen IDEC. It's one of the biggest independent biotech companies in the country. And he offered me a job with the company. However, I wanted to test my own independence and set up a lab of my own. So I did at UMass Medical School, and Wally made me an advisor to Biogen, which provided me with a remarkable uh, chair to watch a company grow and to see how Wally Gilbert went from being a very remarkable scientist and Nobel laureate to being the CEO of a growing company. Uh, that came in handy later. Finally, um, I spent many years very much enjoying work in my laboratory with different people coming and going, but there came a point at which I thought that perhaps it would be better if I took a slightly different direction and began to do science in a way which was helping other people get their work done. And so I moved into administration and came to Northwestern and fell in love with Chicago and the people here and spent seven wonderful years helping to make Northwestern a better institution and to trying to build infrastructure whereby scientists and other investigators could do their work. Uh, my husband and I were commuting over that seven years. He stayed in Boston because he's got the perfect job for him there. So seven years was enough already of commuting, and I went back to Boston and to the Whitehead Institute and uh, became a member of a public company board, which turned into an interesting exper experience when I became the chair of that board and negotiated the sale of that company for uh, over a billion dollars. That was a very interesting experience indeed. Um, that got me even uh, rekindled my interest in business, and I then joined a small company which had, was established by Wally, Wally's son, John, uh, which is the company that I'll tell you about as we go. What I would like to focus on this afternoon is stem cells. I'd like to discuss the three kinds of stem cells and how they're used in biology and medicine, some of the problems that exist with them, and some of the promise and some of the problems that still <coughs> remain. I'm going to talk about three kinds of stem cells. The first is embryonic stem cells. The second are called induced pluripotential stem cells. And the third are adult stem cells. But first, I want to give a little bit of perspective so you'll have some idea of the scale in which we are talking. If you and I were the size of the subcontinent, the United States, South America, and North America, then one cell within that person would be the size of a very large cruise ship. And one protein in that cell or in, in that organism would be the size of a nice yellow dog. 
So a cruise ship is a very is a city as it travels the world, and you can see if you think about a protein as being the size of a dog and a cell being the size of a large cruise ship, that an enormous amount of activity goes on within the living cell. You have you can put a lot of dogs on a cruise ship. Um, and to have those dogs there, you need everything that you need to take care of them, to feed them, uh, to water them, and to keep them going as the cruise ship does its thing. So it is within the human body and the organs that exist within it. So now let's talk about stem cells in particular. Stem cells have several characteristics that we use to define them. The first is that they are immortal. Each stem cell must, when it divides, always gives rise to at least one other stem cell. A stem cell is also undifferentiated. It has no particular identity. If you look at it, you cannot say that it's going to be a heart cell or a muscle cell or a skin cell or any other kind of cell. It's completely ambiguous in its identity. Furthermore, a stem cell has to be able to generate several different kinds of cells. So you will get a heart, or a muscle, or a uh, skin cell from a stem cell. Stem cells come in several flavors. There are the totipotent stem cells. Those are the cells which give rise to, the, to a complete organism. So we know that the fertilized egg is, a, is the totipotent stem cell of all time, because routinely that cell gives rise to a complete organism. Most cells we're not entirely sure that those cells can give rise to a complete and functioning organism, and so those are called pluripotent, because we know they can give rise to many different kinds of cells, but we're not entirely sure they can give rise to every kind of cell. And finally, there's the multipotent stem cells, which are very restricted in their lineage. They can only, for example, give rise to, to skin cells, or only give rise to liver cells, or only give rise to stomach cells. So here we are with the, uh, let's see, is this a laser? Uh, no, okay. Here we have stem cell uh, pattern of, of uh, division where, oops, let's go back, where a stem cell will always give rise to at least one stem cell, and then it may give rise to a cell which is restricted. It's already going down a particular pathway. And when that cell divides, it can give rise to one of itself, but it too may give rise to something which is closer to a finished uh, differentiated cell. And finally, you'll get a terminally differentiated cell, a liver cell, a skin cell, a retinal cell of the eye. So first, let us stem cells. This is from the New York Times some years ago. And what it shows is the first 14 days of human development. The first thing that happens, of course, is that the sperm fertilizes the egg. And then that cell divides into two, and then again into four, and then into eight and then into 16 and so forth. We know that the fertilized egg, the two cell stage, and the four cell stage, those are all totipotent stem cells. If you took any one of those cells, you could get a complete organism, and sometimes you do. Identical twins, identical quintuplets. Um, and then as the cells continue to divide, at one point you start to get a little space, and you see cells that are kind of on the inside in day four, and cells that are around the edge. So that by day five, you have a neat little pack of cells on the inside of a hollow ball of cells. The cells on the inside are called the inner cell mass, and they are going to become the baby. The cells on the outside will become the uh, placenta and all of the support tissues. It is from that inner cell mass that embryonal stem cells are derived. And these are a hot topic in the early part of this decade. So here's what those cells look like if you look at them on the head of a pin. This is a real photograph. It's a scanning electron micrograph. The color is not real. It was added after the fact. Uh, but the size of the needle and the size of the embryonic stem cells are shown at the tip of that needle. There are problems with embryonic stem cells. First of all are the ethical problems. In order to get embryonic stem cells, they are harvested from a developing fetus, a developing human fetus. And fetal tissues are often derived from abortions, elective abortions. And that causes difficulties for many people. And it makes it uh, ethical issues are raised, which uh, make the cells problematic. 
And indeed, there's practical issues as well. Adults don't have access to their own embryonic stem cells anymore. They're gone. And we uh, only have our own uh, adult stem cells. We no longer have embryonic stem cells. There's another thing about embryonic stem cells, which is when you take that inner cell mass and you put them in a culture dish and you allow them to grow, most of them don't. Most of the cells that you put in that dish die. And it's not at all clear what it is that happens that allows some of those cells to continue growing into something that you can grow in culture as an embryonic stem cell. And there are some folks who say that in life there really are no embryonal stem cells, that it's an artifact of removing them into culture. The conditions that you have to put them in, there's been a lot of work to try to figure out what those conditions are. Now, for those cells that grow out, you can then take those cells and put them into another set of very defined conditions, and under the right circumstances, you can force them to become skin cells, or you can force them to become liver cells, or heart cells, or muscle cells. And it took an enormous amount of work to figure out the conditions for each of those, and it doesn't always work. So let us consider the next kind of cell, which is currently a very hot topic. And those are induced uh, pluripotential stem cells, or IPS cells. Now, I want to take a step back and consider what is the difference between a stem cell and a differentiated cell in terms of what's going on inside the cell. What happens as you move from a stem cell to a differentiated cell is that the genes within that cell are going through a highly precise orchestrated program of gene expression. I'll just remind you that every cell has within it a bunch of DNA, and that DNA contains all of the information necessary to make every tissue of the body. But the information is not all used all at once, nor is it all used at the same time. And differentiation is the process of turning on and off genes in a highly defined program. Well, about a decade ago, I guess, maybe longer, a technology was developed which allowed us to look directly at that program and to answer the question, what genes are on at what time in developmental pathways? And I just want to remind you a little bit about how that works. DNA is made up of four chem chemical uh, uh, that we just call A, G, C, and T for short, for the chemicals that they stand for. And the most important thing about DNA is that G always pairs with C and A always pairs with T. And that's what allows the double helix to exist and to be st stable and to pass information from generation to generation. <clears throat> In order for the DNA to express its information, what happens is that strand separates and you copy one strand into a related molecule called RNA, where instead of T, you make U. And so DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is ribonucleic acid. Well, we now know how to isolate DNA from a cell. So we can take all the DNA out of a cell, and we can break it up into small pieces, and we can put it into a little, uh, little wells of plastic. DNA happens to stick to plastic. And then we can add some um, liquid to that, those plastics, a little salt solution. And we can take RNA from a particular cell. Now RNA, remember, rep represents activated genes. So what we do is we mix those pieces of RNA with the DNA, which is immobilized on the plastic dish, and then swish it around, and the DNA will walk into the, it'll fall in, it'll migrate into the wells, and if it matches, it'll stick, and if it doesn't match, when you rinse it, it will be washed away. Now, because scientists are, are clever, they have added to that RNA before they put it into the mix a chemical signal which lights up. So literally, what happens is that you see a glow from that well. And what it looks like is this. This is two little pieces of a very much larger microarray set that's looking at the expression of a particular set of genes. This can be from two different tissues or it can be from cells at different paths along an array of differentiation. So you can figure out what genes are being expressed from a stem cell all the way to the terminally differentiated muscle or nerve or liver. Well, in 2006, and that wasn't that long ago, 
uh, a scientist in uh, Japan, Shinya Yakamana, ya Yamanaka, asked a very simple but very profound question. He said, can we identify genes that are expressed only in stem cells, not in any other time, not in any other cell? And so he used microarray technology to compare the genes that were being expressed in stem cells with the genes being expressed everywhere else, and he found 24. Now, what marked him as more than simply clever was that he then went on to ask yet another question, which was, well, if I can identify 24 genes that are expressed specifically in stem cells and nowhere else, what if I made those genes be expressed in a non-stem cell? Could I reprogram a cell that was no longer a stem cell and force it biochemically to become a stem cell? So he did the experiment and it worked and that's why he won the Nobel Prize. And so what he did was to take, we see here on, on this side, the stem cell is going to terminally differentiate itself. So what he did was take a skin cell and he added the 24 genes and he got the skin cell lost its skinness. It became more amorphous and with time and culture, it began to look like a stem cell. And if he took that stem cell and put it under conditions where he knew he could get a different kind of cell, say a nerve cell, he turned, he made that uh, skin cell go backwards in time to become a stem cell, and he made that stem cell able to become a nerve cell. Well, a lot of people got really excited, and everybody started working on this, and to define the conditions under which one, you could generate embry uh, induced pluripotential stem cells, and under conditions under which you could make them become the different cell types. Now, this was a wonderful finding because it erased the ethical considerations. You no longer needed to obtain cells from fetuses in order to get cells which were stem cells. So this is the current status. Now it only takes three genes of the 24 to make a cell go backwards. You no longer need viruses to carry those genes into the cell. Um, so you eliminate the danger of those viruses. They can, they've been successfully generated in both humans and mice, and they've been used to cure diseases. You can cure a mouse of sickle cell disease. Um, many people consider that embryonic, that these iPS cells are the therapy, cell therapy of the future, and a few people think that it always will be. And that's because there are problems with reprogrammed cells that have not yet been overcome. The major one is, think of what we've done. We have taken a skin cell and we have forced it backwards and we do that very quickly. Now during normal development, it takes a long time to make an egg or a sperm and it takes a good nine months to get an organism out of that single egg. So it, it's a very stately, majestic progression of gene development that we see over time. And when we reprogram cells, sometimes the cells are reprogrammed in a normal way, but sometimes they're not. In the best cases, those cells that are reprogrammed inappropriately or can't quite fold themselves upright die, so you never see them. And in fact, experimentally, we know that this is a low efficiency event. And sometimes you get cells that are, uh, they aren't quite the same as a normal cell, but close enough, and you can get these tissues out of them. So there are a number of, of, of issues that yet remain, and people are busily working at trying to define what it is that makes a good iPS cell, how you change that iPS cell into tissue, and how you overcome some of these difficulties that have been seen experimentally. In the meantime, there are adult stem cells which have been in use now for quite some time. Adult stem cells are cells which are found in tissues, and their job is to replace that tissue. Skin, for example, wears out pretty quickly. So you have to replace your skin cells very often. So skin cells have stem cells that only make skin. Intestine is another place, very harsh environment, all that acid, some of us more than others. So those cells die pretty quickly and they need to be replaced. So there's a lot of stem cells in the intestines and in the stomach. There's also, turns out to be cells in muscle. You know, when you exercise and you're bulking up as you're doing strength changing, what you've done is you're damaging muscle and then you're replacing that muscle. And that's how you build muscle when you exercise. And that comes from muscle stem cells. 
for a while, people thought that that's where stem cells were, only in these kinds of tissues that needed to replace themselves. And many people thought that you would not find stem cells, for example, in the brain. Uh, tissues where you seem to just put them down and that's it, maybe it's all you got. And we in fact thought that once we were over 21, we started losing brain cells at a remarkable rate. Well, it turns out that was wrong too. That in fact, the brain does have stem cells and that it, that it can regenerate cells under particular conditions. For example, you know those guys in London who drive the taxis and they know the entire, every road in London? Those guys' brain grows. People who are expert in music or language will have growth even as an adult in that area of the brain. So it's really true, use it or lose it. So practice, exercise your brain and you will put down brain cells that are quite useful uh, in the end. A well-known tissue that has stem cells is the blood. The blood uh, has within it not only the red blood cells, which allow us to live by carrying oxygen to every other tissue, but also the immune system, which goes around through the blood and lymph, protecting us from invaders and even clearing out aberrant cells like cancer cells. Fat cells, by the way, have stem cells, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Everywhere. So embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotential stem cells are all potential for therapeutic use. But there is a cell therapy that has been in use for a very long time, 30 years or more, and which is known to be effective. It is curative for some cancers and could be useful for others. The problem is it has a rather unfortunate side effect, and that is that it could kill you. Um, so it's not widely used, or as widely used as it could be. And this is this therapy is called bone marrow transplants, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, where somebody who gets cancer and fails treatment, that is, chemotherapy and radiation therapy and drugs have not been able to kill the cancer, those folks will be given a bone marrow transplant as a last resort. And what is happening to those people is that their, their immune system, along with the cancer, is killed with chemistry and with radiation, and so you have to put the immune system back. And what you're doing is taking stem cells from somebody else's system and giving it to the patient. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So over the last 30 years, as bone marrow transplants have been done around the world, they've not only been shown to be curative for some cancers, but they're also an effective treatment for some really serious genetic diseases like uh, very severe anemia, where the blood cells don't work properly for some genetic syndromes in children, but all of this has been curtailed because of this very dangerous side effect. If this treatment could be made safe, you could get rid of this awful side effect where this immune system is attacking the patient, why then you would have a very effective and relatively benign cell therapy that is already proven for any number of years. So let's talk about these cells. They're called hematopoietic stem cells. Hematopoietic means of the blood. They're very rare. One cell in a million in the blood, um, in, a, in marrow, which is where they're most abundant, is a stem cell. And these cells are capable of giving rise to all of the cells of the immune system and the red blood cells as well. And this is a little picture of how that works. The single cell divides and gives rise to two kinds of progenitor cells, one of which produces all those cells you see up on top, and the other of which produces the bottom two rows. The red blood cells are, of course, a major part of it, and they represent about 45% of the blood. If you just take blood, 45% of it is red blood cells. About half of it is liquid, which contains protein and sugar and all those other good things. And a little tiny band of about 10% or less is the white blood cells, which is all the rest of those cells, and the immune system. The immune system cells look pretty much alike. They look pretty much like those diagrams up there. Um, but they're turning out to be very complex. And in fact, the immune system is more complex than any other tissue in the body, with the possible exception of the brain. And I'm beginning to believe that the immune system is at least as complicated as the brain. And the brain is pretty darn complicated. We have, um, in the cerebellum alone, enough cells that are, the, are as there are stars in our universe anyway. Um, and each of those cells is connected to, to 10,000 other cells 
And that complexity is what allows me to stand up here and talk to you and you to sit down there and listen to me. The immune system is almost that complicated and maybe more complicated. Remember, the immune system can recognize a pathogen, a, dis a, a germ that it's never seen before. And it has a, the ability to recognize anything that we can throw at it, including things that we build. So it's a very remarkable system. Where do you get these bone marrow cells? Well, obviously you can get them from the bone marrow, but that's really, that's a surgical procedure. You take a big needle and you stick it into your hip bone and pull out a lot of cells. It hurts. Um, you don't feel so well afterwards. You require anesthesia. So obviously people are not going to be pounding at the door to donate bone marrow unless they're highly incented, like it's their kid or their wife or their child who's sick. Peripheral blood is much easier to collect. You sit in a comfortable chair, there's a needle in both arms, and while you sit there, blood comes out of one arm, goes into a machine which spins out the cells, and the red blood cells and the, and the liquid part are put back through the other arm. Four hours, you're done, you take your orange juice and go, and you've made a donation of cells which can save somebody's life. Even more painless is umbilical cord. When a baby is born, if you collect the umbilical cord blood, that blood is enough for a child's transplant and two of them can be used for an adult. So uh, in many cases when kids are born now, you can donate the, the umbilical cord for transplants later. In some cases you can save it for that child's use if you want. So this attack of the cells on the patient is called graft, which is the incoming transplant versus host disease, the host being the patient. And it's really ugly. Um, what happens is it tends to happen first in the skin and stomach. They're the most uh, exposed to the cells that are doing the attack. And you can see here some of the manifestations of graft versus host in skin. It comes from a particular kind of cell in the immune system called a T cell. Uh, T cells like one of those things like dogs. You know, it's, you can say dogs, but there are a million different kinds of dogs, and there are very many different kinds of T cells. So when it can happen, it's anything from unpleasant to life-threatening. And about 60% of the people who get a bone marrow transplant end up getting severe graft-versus-host disease, and 20 to 40% of those people who get the disease will die from it. So. Some T cells are responsible for the graft versus host disease effect. Different T cells will attack cancer cells, and yet different T cells from those will attack viruses and bacteria and protect you from being infected. So a successful graft would have the stem cells, because those are, make everybody, and the right set of T cells, or at least some way to inhibit those T cells. And we know that this can be done because we've been doing it for 20 years in mice. Mice are cute little creatures. We know two things about them. One is that they are small and a pretty good model for human disease, but they're not human. There are differences. And once you find something out in a mouse, you really have to check it out in a human to be sure it will work. So there are several approaches that have worked in mice, and we don't really know which of those will work in humans because, for the most part, we haven't been able to do the experiment. How do we tell one T cell from the other? Well, if you look at a T cell carefully, it's a little bit like looking at the coat of different species of dogs. Different colors, different crinkliness, and so forth. Every cell has on its surface proteins that are specific for that kind of cell. And you can recognize those proteins with another protein whose job it is to bind to proteins. They actually come from a, one cell of the immune system. They're called antibodies. So we've learned how to make these antibodies, and we can make them in laboratories, and they are now being sold for experimental use and for therapeutic use all over the place. You can label these antibodies. You can take an antibody and you can connect to it a chemical, which, when it's hit by a laser light, will give you a flash of color. So you can take three different antibodies to three different proteins and label them with different fluorophores. That's what those chemicals are called. And the intensity of a fluorescent color when you run a laser across that cell tells you, more or less, how many of those proteins there are on the cell. 
So you can see the two cells that I have there. One of them has yellow and blue, and the other one has yellow and red. And you can look at each cell independently using a technology called fluorescence activated cell sorting, which works this way. What happens is you have a very large machine. It's about the size of this podium plus. It has a laser, a, co a heavy duty computer, and a tank of liquid. What you do is you put the cells in the liquid and you force them through a nozzle at high pressure that's shaking so the cell ends up in a drop. The drop falls out of the machine and it goes in front of the laser beam. The laser beam causes a, a, the, any antibody that's on the cell to fluoresce and the computer detects that that light goes into a wire which is connected up to a computer and the computer says, aha, this has antibodies that I want or that I don't want. So as the drop falls down, the computer sends a signal back and you turn on a mag uh, an electric field which electrifies the cell and forces it into one or another tube. So you can, can select cells that contain particular markers on their surface or you can eliminate cells with particular markers on their surface. And that's called optical sorting. Um, and I already said this, so I don't need to say it again. Now, there's another way of doing things um, because the problem with fluorescence activated cell sorting is that works for mice. And that's how we've been able to make grafts that don't cause graft versus host disease in mice. We sort the cells and then we put them in the mice. You don't need very many cells to put in a mouse because they're so little. But if you're a human being, you need a lot more cells. And it turns out to be very difficult to get enough cells by using a standard fluorescence activated cell sorter. So people developed another methodology which kind of approached it. It was a bulk sorting method. And what it does is you put a little magnet on the antibody instead of a fluorophore. And what that does, you can see down here, I've got some uh, the two, same two cells I had before, but now they've got a magnet on them. That allows you to isolate cells very quickly because you run them through a machine and turn on a magnet. You suck all the cells with a magnet on it on, uh, very quickly. But you now can't tell the difference between a cell that's got a lot of an antibody or a little bit of that same antibody. And if you're looking at two different antibodies, you can't tell them apart anymore. This is the machine that was invented to do that work. It's called, it's a clinical bead based. Those are the little magnetic beads. And using this, you can, everything's enclosed. You use sterile bags and sterile fluid. So you can use them in people, and they are being used in people. But it's not very discriminating, and, and yields are unpredictable, and there's other problems. So in mice, for about, oh, 20 years now, we've been using fluorescence-activated cell sorting and available markers. There are now over 300 of them to identify particular cells and try different combinations and we can prevent cancer and autoimmune diseases like diabetes, multiple sclerosis, uh, celiac disease, a large number of things in mice. In people, it has been much harder because we have to approximate the sorted cells and so we're stuck with the tools that we have and the limited tools that we have have meant that we really haven't been able to reproduce in people what we've been able to do in mice. So if we're going to do sorting for medical use, we need several things. It needs to be fast, it needs to be sterile, and you need to be able to do multiple markers so that you can really look at each cell and see what's there. And as I've said, the current technology, fluorescence activated cell sorters are too slow to generate a dose, and the magnetic beads that are fast enough can't use multiple markers. So that's the current state of affairs. Right now what we know, given those tools, is that there are some very promising approaches out there that say that it looks like you really can prevent or damp down graft versus host disease, so it's much less of a problem. And it's being used in clinical trials for a variety of uses, uh, which say that you can use auto, these, this treatment for autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, and it's even being used for heart disease. Um, although that's an interesting thing, which perhaps you may want to ask about later. To demonstrate the power of this technology, I want to use these two boys here. This is a slide from Joanne Kurtzberg, who's a pediatrician at Duke University. 
who is, she's a very brave woman. It takes a brave person to do a bone marrow transplant in a baby, and that's what she does. These two boys have Crabbe's disease. This is a devastating genetic disease. A single protein is mutated, and the lack of that protein working well means that the boy's brain is not able to develop properly, so you don't wrap the nerves the way they should be wrapped. As a result of that, the child with this syndrome loses uh, function, becomes severely mentally retarded, loses motor control so that the child can't walk, can't move his or her limbs, is really very badly affected. So the child in the, in the stroller is the older of these two boys. And he was diagnosed with having this disease when he was about five months old and got a transplant at the age of six or seven months. As you can tell by looking at him, it did not prevent the motor effects of the disease. This child has no motor control. His intelligence, however, is normal. He's a very bright little kid. He just can't control any of his movements. His little brother, who's two years younger, was diagnosed and checked because of the uh, knowing that the older child had it. They checked the second child very, very early. And it was recognized that this kid had the same disease, and he got a transplant at two or three months, I forgot what. Totally normal kid. This child is now 12, completely normal intelligence, completely normal development, obviously able to walk around and provide as much difficulty as any uh, young boy can. Now, Joanne has done this with children with other kinds of genetic diseases. And because the blood-brain barrier that uh, is so permeable in children, diseases which ordinarily would, would uh, condemn a child to a very difficult life or to no life at all are now able to be cured. And because babies are small, then you need fewer cells. And so she's able to do these things uh, with children who are much younger. She's now trying to do transplants with, with babies in utero. Uh, which are even tinier and is having a good amount of success. So for cell therapy right now, this is the best of times in many ways. We have a lot of promise in pluripotential stem cells, despite what I said about it being the uh, therapy of the future forever. We're learning a lot really rapidly. And one thing about biology is things that you learn, even if it doesn't become medically relevant, can lead you in directions which will be medically relevant. And so this is a very exciting field, and many talented people are doing a lot of work there. In many ways, though, it's also the worst of times. There's still a difficulty of rejection. We haven't solved that quite yet. Funding is difficult now for research, and it's likely to get worse if we hit that fiscal cliff. So whatever your inclination is, please vote. Um, and finally, we can't put many of the findings into the clinic because the tools aren't available. And that's where my company comes in. As I said earlier, in order to do cell sorting for clinical use, you need an instrument which is fast, provides high purity of the cells, provides high yield of those cells, is able to recognize uh, different antibodies. You can look at more than one protein at a time. And is sterile, because you don't want to infect somebody who doesn't have an immune system. And Magnetic beads have two of these, but not the others. And conventional cell sorters have the middle three, but they lack the outer two. So Cybenome is engaged in building a machine which has all of these properties and which uh, will, we hope, make a huge difference in bone marrow transplants in the clinic. So I'm going to end by telling you a tiny little bit about what our machine does. This is, is a picture of the machine itself and Vinay Ratman, who's the technician who does most of the work on the machine in the middle, and around it you see the various technologies that we have to use in order to get this thing to work. Now I have to tell you, the idea for this machine arose in 2002, um, and the critical inventions were made in microfluidics before that. John Gilbert, the founder, brought them with him to the company, and he spent a year figuring out that the best use of his technology was to build such a machine. It's the other engineering which has taken so long for us to get right turns out to be a, a, a substantial engineering challenge. So this machine, the key technology was the parallel microfluidic and the switch, which you see in the upper right-hand corner. The disposable cell cartridge, so everything is contained. It's got really neat optical design, 
uh, a sorter, uh, an activator, which uses piezoelectric little switches, which I'll tell you about in a minute. We have a honkin' powerful laser in there. It's a, it's a, it's a really big laser. Let's just say that there's a lot of laser-proof glasses and protections around because it's a very powerful laser. And we split that laser into separate beams in order that each beam can go through one of those uh, channels in the chip. And that requires a highly precise uh, mirror, segmented mirror. Um, and then, of course, finally, we have very high-density electronics because in the end, that machine that you see there, I told you that a standard sorter is about the size of the podium plus. Well, the machine is the equivalent. Our first version will be the equivalent of 24 of those in one place. And our second version will be 72. So the, the computing power that we need and the strength of the laser is all explained by the fact that we have a parallel microfluidic chip in there. And I'm going to explain what the parallel microfluidic chip is now. So it's really not that different from a standard sorter if you lay it on edge. You have a place where the liquid comes in. You have a place that you shine the laser through to detect the cell. You have a place where you switch. That is, in the standard sorter, you turn on an electric switch. And in our case, we use a piezoelectric uh, fast particle switch. Our sorter is all enclosed. Instead of drops, it's a continuous flow of liquid. So it's microfluidics. Now, the problem, microfluidics have been around for quite a long time. The problem was, was that it's, got a, it's a continuous flow of liquid. If you try to move the flow of liquid, that's slow. Because you move the flow of liquid, and then it's got to recover. So John's signal invention was a way to do that very rapidly and not move the whole flow of liquid, but just a little plug. And the way, so what we do is we have one of those little switches, and you can see it's very, I mean, one of those little channels. It's very small, a little micro channel. It's 900 microns by about 12 millimeters, and we can stack them up. So you can go faster by putting more together. So any one channel only does 2,000 events per second. But if you have 24 of them, that's 48,000 events per second. And if you have 72, 144, and so on, you can get really fast. It's gentle. It's a standard flow of liquid. So in fact, it's easier on the cells than the droplet sorter is. Now this is the magic, which is the switch. The way that it works is he, John used a, a phenomenon that's well known to people who know microfluidics. If you have a tiny little channel, and you've got a little bump in it, a tube, a separate tube that's closed, you will trap air. It will happen as night follows day. So he, instead of using that as a problem, he used it to his advantage. So each of those little long tubes has two little channels coming off of it. One of them has a membrane at the bottom, A, and the other one is completely enclosed. So, and up here you see the flow of liquid. So the cells are in, the, there's liquid throughout, but the, there's a core of liquid that's the bright green in that channel. And there's a Y shape you see, and the default mode is everything goes down one path. When you see, a, when the cell back somewhere over here, where the flag is, when the laser shines up and says, oh, this is a cell that I want, the computer will then send a signal to the piezoelectric activator, and it will push up on the membrane that's on one of those cells. Well, it's a closed system. So when you push up, you force that, well, that little thing of liquid up. And that moves the cell from the default pathway, kicks it up into a new pathway, so it goes down the second tube instead of the first. And that's how the sorting works. And that part actually works pretty much all the time, and has since 2002. So with the switch and the development of, of the sterile <coughs> cartridge, Everything can be done sterilely. We can sort very rapidly for people. Um, we're now on our fifth prototype, which is working in the laboratory. We've set up some collaborations with folks because they're very eager to see if their particular experiment with T cells will be able to be used. We know that people at Stanford, at the Hutch, at MD Anderson, any of the major medical centers that do bone marrow transplants would be very interested to have a technology which would allow them to test their best ideas about what should be done for people who need a bone marrow transplant. So what we're doing is building not an answer, but enabling tool, something which will allow those guys to get, and gals, to get 
the answer that they want for bone marrow transplants. Thank you. If you have any questions for Dr. Via Komarov, if you would please come to the side aisles. Peggy's there with microphone and I'm here with one as well. Questions? Well, let me thank you again for coming, and I'll stick around for a bit.